start, and we'll start with Chris Johnson from Sportsnet. Go ahead, Chris. Hey, Kyle. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm just wondering where things stand now. You know, how likely you think it is you use the pick tomorrow night, the number 15 pick, or is it still something that might be traded? Uh I mean, I, I think it's – with this draft being just a little bit different, uh, Chris, and, and not being live and, and in person, you know, I, it, there have been a, – a, there's been a little bit more discussion on shifting around of, of picks in the first round. There's, there seems to be a lot of interest in, in moving up in the round um, for, for whatever reason. So, um, you know, we're, we're going through that. We've got our, some final meetings here uh, this afternoon into, uh, into this evening and then again tomorrow. And uh, we'll sort of establish um, – when and how uh, we would make the pick or whether we'd, we'd move out of it, whether it's um, to go up in the draft to select something or back in the draft or uh, in trade for players. But it's really all sort of on the table right now. And, and I, don't, I don't think with where we're at, we can, um, we can uh, turn away from, from considering anything. So uh, I'd, I'd love to give you a, a percentage or, or some level of certainty of what we'll do, but I, I really don't uh, know at this point. And, I think we have to consider everything given uh, given the circumstances that uh, that we're in and that the league is in. Great, thanks, Chris. We'll move to uh, Lance Hornby from the Toronto Sun. Go ahead, Lance. Oh, hi, Kyle. Um, can you uh, first of all maybe address the Jason Spezza resigning and in the bigger picture, um, what is the deal about uh, trying to make the Leafs? harder to play against uh, next season. Um, I know you wanted that to grow organically, but uh, sure. what, uh, what other steps do you think uh, might be in the cards uh, in, in terms of uh, reaching that goal? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lance. Um, the, the Jason Spezza, I'll address him first. Um, at, the, at the conclusion of the season, a few weeks after our season ended um, against Columbus, Jason and I sat down uh, and, and had a discussion about where he felt he was at, whether he wanted to continue um, you know, what he, how he felt about his role with the team. Uh, he and I had a great conversation and then, and uh, he subsequently had a discussion with Sheldon um, about his role and, and uh, what was expected of him and, and what he could expect from, from uh, Sheldon and myself as, as we rolled ahead and seemed like it was just a great fit. Um, I think in their, uh, I think uh, the, the, the image of Jason is he's, uh, he's a veteran um, He's a veteran in the mold, more of Roger Dorn, uh, but I, I view him more as, uh, after being with him for a year, as more of a Jake Taylor type, to use that analogy, um, from Major League, in that he's been excellent with our, our young players, great experience, works his butt off every single day uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the facility, and has just been outstanding, an, an outstanding addition for us, and, and is someone that I didn't really know a year ago uh, when he came in here uh, and just his work ethic, his passion for the game and the fact that uh, he desperately wants to win for obvious reasons and uh, that he's willing to spend as much time as, as any young player wants and helping them, um, you know, work through their start to their career or various challenges in their career, even if they're older players on our team, using his own experiences uh, from his career from junior and, and, and long time in the NHL. So we're fortunate to, to have him and have him around here for another season. Uh, and then with regards to making the team hard to play against, uh, I think it goes without saying we, we would like to be incredibly hard to play against. And yes, some of that does have to happen organically, but um, as, as, our, as our players continue to mature and grow, and I think the playoffs this year showed a number of teams that, that have a number of examples of that, of teams doing that with their own guys sort of altering their mindset and, and having some uh, setbacks that have forced them to play a different way at times. But also uh, there's, there's no doubt that uh, it is something that we would like to address um, through free agency or through trades that come up and, and uh, it is a priority of ours. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lance. Uh, we'll go with Danielle Emanuel from Leafs Nation Network. Go ahead, Danielle. Hi, Kyle. Thank you for doing this. Um, I'm curious to know, what is your setup going to look like for the draft? Typically, there is that energy and the business, of, busyness of being on the floor. So what do you anticipate tomorrow is going to feel like? Uh, well, uh, Reed Mitchell and, uh, and the staff at MLSE have worked tirelessly. Uh, Nick Eves, Caroline Wright, Mark James and their staff to, to create um, an atmosphere that's safe in terms of everything that's going on in the world. So socially distanced, but also be able to try to have everybody together. So, so far we've run our meetings all virtually, including these final meetings. Um, even if we're in the building, everyone in, in separate offices, 
um, especially as the as the case loads have continued to rise in in Ontario and in Toronto. Um, so we've we've maintained all of those practices that the Toronto Public Health and the Ontario government have have pushed us to. Tomorrow we'll move to uh, operating out of the dressing room actually here at um, at Scotiabank Arena. And uh, I think Steve and, and his staff and our social team will send out some images of that setup for everybody that so they can have an idea of what tomorrow will be like for us. But uh, we're not going to have too many of us here, which will be very, very different. We usually have our whole scouting staff. Uh, this season, we only have John Lilly, um, our director of amateur scouting, who's traveled in uh, from Boston. And, um, you know, everyone else has been uh, on Zoom. So it, it won't be that different, fortunately, I think, from the experiences I had in Sault Ste. Marie, we, the draft there was was held virtually so every team was in their own individual market and whatever setup that they had so um, it'll be much different than any of the the previous I guess six drafts it's been five or six uh, since I've been here now but uh, fortunate to have some experience like like it from the OHL where you're just kind of all sitting in your own room and you see the picks come in on TV or via the the conference call. And just with the draft traditionally being held in June, how has this extra time served the organization well for decision making and just doing your due diligence when it comes to picks and prospects? Well, uh, John, really, I, 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 you can correct me if I have the exact dates wrong, but I think it was March the 12th that everything shut down. And on the 13th and by, by the end of the day on the 12th, I, I think every hockey league uh, in the world was essentially shut down. And so the next day we had a conference call and uh, led by Reed Mitchell and John Lilly uh, and Dave Morrison and Wes Clark here and right away sort of pivoted the way that we did our scouting and um, shifted everything to video and tried to maximize our coverage of every player and get everybody involved in, in the scouting process um, and cross-checking the players and so on and so forth. So I think we have a, a very deep read on, on every player and, and we've covered a lot of games of them using the, the resources uh, in terms of video and, and coverage that we, we have. So uh, I think in terms of the amount of games we've seen on each player this year would certainly be, be the best. It's, they're not live viewings and they are video, which, which does have some limitations. But um, in terms of the, the amount of deep work that's been able to be done on every prospect, I would say this year uh, far surpasses the previous years and we'll probably take some of the, the uh, elements that we've learned this season ahead with us uh, as things hopefully return to normal in the coming months and years. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Danielle. We'll move to Mark Masters, TSN. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, uh, Kyle. Just what's your assessment of how deep this, this draft is? And if you do hold on to that pick at 15, how quickly that, that player may end up helping you in the NHL? Oh, um, I think everybody, it seems every year at the draft, everyone says the, the, this is a deep draft, but I would, I would say that this year is, is uh, certainly carries more of that um, narrative than others. Uh, I'm always tentative to kind of brand the drafts uh, at the time because usually they, they take four or five years to get a true read of how many guys are truly going to pan out. And I think this season, Mark, uh, with, with the amount of time everyone's had to invest in the draft, particularly from March to June, I think, um, you know, there's certainly been a lot more focus and attention on it across everybody in hockey, not just the people working, you know, in scouting, but in management, coaches, media, uh, so on and so forth during that, that pause when uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on in the world that gave you a chance to kind of to, uh, do deeper dives on the draft. So I think we are, we are happy with the, uh, with the depth of the draft. It's one of the reasons why we made the trade with Pittsburgh, knowing their pick and, and to, to land ourselves at this slot. Um, and we have 11 picks in the draft. So we're, we're excited about it. It's a great opportunity for us with regards to, to how soon the, the player that we pick at, you know, 15 or 44 can, uh, can make it into our lineup. Uh, I think, you know, for better, or for worse, the, the economics and the way that they've changed in the last number of months are, are going to uh, put a major focus on, on development and having younger players that, that have tremendous talent try to get to the league as soon as possible. Um, it's not to say that we would uh, rush anybody unjustly, but just the fact that I think these players are also, um, uh, in terms of their training and their, and their physical development, tend to be every year it seems they're further and further along. And um, Nick Robertson's probably a, the, the latest example of that with us. And so um, I never try to, to limit them. And certainly there's going to be a need, not just here, but all across the league for talented players uh, on entry level contracts to be in and contributing. So uh, I don't know how soon that will be, uh, but I would say it's probably going to expedite itself a little bit for, for all teams, would be my uh, forecast. Thank you. 
Thanks, Mark. We'll go uh, Kevin McGrath and Toronto Star. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for doing this. I've got a couple of questions. One, you guys sort of specific. Um, when it comes to drafting these players and your other young players, how do you go about developing them in a world of where they, they might not uh, be able to even play hockey in some locations. Like how, what are the concern level for uh, like a, a developmental gap, if you will, for this generation of players? And the second question is very, is very of a generic point of view, not, not you specific, but where do you see the free agent market going in terms of a flat cap? And would players defer salary, do you think, um, till, or defer signing bonuses to later in their, uh, in their thing? But two separate questions, but please, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the first question is, is easier to answer. Um, I think it, uh, Kevin, like one of the things we've had to accept in, in the last number of months is, is we can't, uh, certainly development is going to be different. And uh, we've tried to uh, adapt to that a little bit already by assigning some of our players um, to different places in Europe, whether it's Igor Korshkov to, to Lokomotiv or uh, Philip Kral. Uh, we've got Christian Rubens who we've just assigned to a, a club in Denmark actually. Um, so we, we've got a few players that, that we've assigned there. We've obviously got Philip uh, Hollander in Lulia in, in the SHL as well. So there's, there's that option for the, the development in terms of playing actual games. Uh, when it comes to some players that are, that are in North America or that have other needs, I think as much as it's disappointing that there aren't games right now and, and the health of, and the situation in terms of the pandemic in the world needs to come first, I think this also presents a, a tremendous opportunity for a younger player that maybe has some physical and strength limitations to make major gains uh, without having to focus on playing any games at all. You can really focus on your work strength and conditioning or, or on the ice with uh, various different skating coaches or instructors and, and, and really make gains in terms of your strength and your on ice uh, technical ability. Um, even though I know games are much more fun than, than that, the daily work of that going over a, a long, long stretch of, of months. But I think we can, we have to worry about what we can control and, and do the, do uh, the absolute best to maximize the circumstances that come our way and carry on our development in different ways. But um, it's, it's been, it's been challenging, but the development staff, I think that we've, they had a virtual development camp in August um, with, with our, with our players and try to continue to help them as much as we can. Um, with regards to the free agent market, what I would say on that is that, you know, with no interview period here, I really don't know what it's going to look like. And we don't, uh, unlike the previous number of years, we don't really have um, the big name much talked about free agents of our own. So uh, I really don't have a great read on, um, on what the, the, the structures of the contracts are, are going to look like and, and likely won't until uh, until Friday. Um, I've seen some of the contracts that, that uh, come in uh, that have come in over the last number of weeks. And they certainly speak to, I think what you're alluding to Kevin of uh, players trying to backload the contracts a little bit within the rules um, to, uh, to try to maybe provide the team some um, economic relief and, and to give themselves a better chance of, of uh, making those dollars when, when escrow and, and various other limitations go down. But uh, it's, it's all hard for, for me to, uh, to predict how it will look on Friday, Saturday, and, and into the weekend, probably. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. We'll go uh, Jonas Siegel from The Athletic. Go ahead, Jonas. Hey, Kyle, I'm just wondering if you've gotten anything close uh, as far as moving that first round pick that you talked about earlier. No, uh, we've had uh, we've had lots of different discussions on it, but nothing that I would say has been overly close. Uh, that's I mean, it, things can change at any minute, but there's uh, there's been lots of discussion. I would classify it as lots of uh, tire kicking, but uh, but nothing close uh, as yet that that would really compel us to to look to to move it. Thank you, uh, Terry Koshin, Charles Sun. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, good morning, Kyle. Thanks for doing this. Uh, listen, I'm sure you've seen a lot of the speculation regarding Freddie Anderson and, and uh, his future with the club. Do um, you expect him to be in goal for you guys on opening night, uh, barring anything else? And, and uh, you know, where do you, where do you go with that, uh, given his contract status uh, a year from now? Yeah, well, I, I thanks, Terry. Uh, I mean, I, I know where the, the Fred speculation started and, and comes from, and uh, rather than address it publicly or or um, be hostile about it, I, I've just direct I've just addressed it directly with Fred. Um, so he and I have have uh, had many discussions uh, over the last month or so about that. 
so he knows where we stand directly. And um, as of this moment, yes, I, I expect him to uh, to be the starting goalie for our team. Um, I was just going to say come October, but uh, whenever that uh, uh, whenever we get going here. So that's uh, yeah, that's the way I, I feel about Fred. Thanks. Thank you. We'll go Luke Fox from Sportsnet. Go ahead, Luke. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for doing this. Um, I'm curious what you took away from the Tampa Bay Lightning's run in terms of your own club, if it's tweaked or reinforced your vision in terms of roster construction or style of play or, or what you may have learned from maybe the, the final four teams that went deep. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Luke. I, I think there, there's always um, – there's always things you can learn from and, and not, not even just in, in hockey, but in, in all the other sports teams that, um, that uh, go a long way in the playoffs and that have very successful seasons. And certainly I think there's a lot that we can learn from, from Tampa. Um, you know, I, I also think they're, they're in a much, their, their situation isn't uh, exactly the same as ours for, for a number of different reasons. And um, I'm always tentative. I think that the natural natural inclination is to always, uh, hope to mimic um, uh, mimic the the team that um, that just won and and to copy them, but as you see from year to year, it changes in terms of the style of teams that win. If you go to Pittsburgh's two championships, then it was Washington and St. Louis, and then Tampa. I think you always want to be continuing to challenge ourselves. Obviously, we've had uh, disappointing ends to to our last uh, four seasons, and that we we haven't won, and and that's our goal. Um, I think in in the things that you you look at in Tampa that certainly stood out to me and. I know there are, there are a lot of the, the acquisitions that they made during the year. I think Julian uh, is a great general manager and did a great job. They've got a great coach and a great core of players. And um, th there's two things I hope that our, our whole organization takes. And that's number one, they had a major uh, disappointment after essentially a, rec a record setting regular season for them the year prior and how that affected their mindset uh, more than anything heading into this season in terms of, um, their focus and competitiveness and, and how they wanted to play and then how it manifested itself uh, through the regular season as well as the playoffs. Like the fear that uh, you always have or that, that I think about a lot is the fact that I think you're, you're going to hear a lot that our, uh, our team is going to be judged in the playoffs, which it will. But I think one of the key things that we, we have done the last number of years is we've, whether it was a start last season or uh, kind of the spell at the end of the 2018-19 season where We've had bad stretches in the regular season that have cost us being higher up in the standings uh, and giving ourselves a more favorable position going into the standings. This year, of course, that manifested itself in us being in the qualification round and not uh, not in the uh, round robin. So I think the, the key for us uh, that we can learn is that how important the regular season is in our mindset and our focus and our competitiveness every day in the regular season and about how that regular season serves you in the playoffs. It serves you in your positioning. And then it serves you in the fact that you've built the way to play competitively throughout the whole year uh, that can serve you in the playoffs. Um, and then the other part from, from Tampa in particular is the fact that I, I thought, you know, a lot of their best players faced huge questions after the 2019 loss. And I thought their best players from, you know, each and every one of them, was spectacular in the playoffs. They were extremely competitive. They produced at a very high level. They responded when the team was down. And as much as there's the focus on the on the changes around the outside of the roster, uh, which I, I thought were great moves, I think it was the, the top end of their roster and how competitive they were and how they dominated from uh, from the minute that they got inside the bubble to, to winning the Stanley Cup. That, that really stood out to me, and, and I hope that, that we take from it. And just to follow up uh, on a different note, can you give us an update on where things stand with your RFAs and if you expect to qualify all of them? Uh, well, there, we, there's quite a few. I guess I'll address the the NHL roster ones. Uh, yeah. In that we're we're still going through that that process, and it's uh, I don't uh, mean to take the uh, take a cop out on it, but I mean with so much going on, and I know there there are teams now that are releasing which which players they've queued out and not, and so our view is that we're going to wait uh, before we do anything before the, the deadline that we have of uh, Wednesday at five and see if other teams are, are non queuing players that we think might be improvements for us before we act. So, um, you know, I think with, with the time uh, that we have, we're, we're going to use it and, and, um, and make sure that we aren't doing anything preemptively that, that might restrict us. Thank you. 
I'm going to finish off with three questions. Josh Cloak, Mike in Buffalo, and Lance Hornby. So we'll start with Josh Cloak. Josh, go ahead. Thanks, Steve. Kyle, as you approach free agency and you have the need to kind of manage the cap, uh, what do you think it is that makes Brandon so valuable to your organization? Oh, Brandon Pridham. Uh, well, um, I talk to him 600 times a day with different questions and I think the major the major benefit that he has is he'll tell me uh, very bluntly when what I'm thinking is is crazy and, and not workable and, and just the number of different scenarios that he has planned out and and the way that he's able to forecast contracts and and then you know I think more most importantly for us now it Josh it's it's looking ahead at the next number of years so whatever you do now in terms of adding to your your mix is going to also not only impact now but it's if you, if you look a few years out and, you know, we've got our core guys sort of locked up for this season, but then you get a year out, you have Fred and Zach Hyman. A year beyond that, you have Morgan Riley. So, and if you don't forecast the cap to go up, which, which the leg formula and new uh, collective bargaining agreement largely prohibits, everything that you do now is going to have a large effect moving out. In the past, you used to be able to project, and we were very conservative with this, uh, a small gains in the cap each season. And that's sort of out the window now. So Brandon, uh, more than any other time, uh, having him being able to forecast where that's going to go, where contracts are going to go, um, it's a massive, massive value. And, and uh, I don't know that there's any person that I talk to more in my day-to-day. -day and uh, his value to, to the team and to myself is, is so incredibly massive uh, because of his knowledge of the cap and knowledge of the rules and, and way that we can, ways that we can be creative and make things work. So... Um, yeah, I, I couldn't do without him uh, here, uh, I guess, is the easiest way to describe uh, Brandon Pridham. And a quick follow, if you don't mind, on a different topic. If you keep the 15th pick, is there a specific player or position that you're looking at? Uh, if we, I think, you know, that we've, you know, if, the last two first round picks we've had, we've used on defense. Um, and so that's not to say that we, we wouldn't use another on D. I think our philosophy has always been when we get there, because it's it's not like football or, or basketball even uh, where the player is going to make an immediate impact in, in, on your roster and on your positioning. I think the, the way that we've always approached it is to try to find the, you know, just to, to select the best player and not reach for a position, even though um, there's always, I think, um, a bit of a pull to do that when you have certain holes on your roster. But it, because of because of the lag time between draft and, and making an impact on the NHL roster isn't, uh, isn't as quick as it is in some other sports like the, the, where the draft gets as much attention, uh, such as basketball and football. I think, our, I think just sticking to, to who we feel is the best available player uh, is, is the way to, to help the team best moving ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mike in Buffalo. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, Kyle. I uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, quick question about the draft. Um, with the uncertainty of what's going on in the CHL right now because of COVID, we don't know how long the season's going to be, how long, uh, when it's going to start. Will that impact you or potentially other general managers in terms of drafting CHL players because you have a window of two years to get them signed, whereas NCAA players or European players, there's a longer window for evaluation? Yeah, it's a, actually not even two years now, Mike, because yeah. we, we're going to draft them tomorrow night and Wednesday, and, and uh, you've already – lost four of the of the 23 months that you usually have and, and you're not going to it doesn't seem like we'll get them in for a development camp or to work with our people so uh yeah the the, the runway there uh, certainly is much shorter than it usually is what i would say is is because there's so much uncertainty and so much unknown i i still think we would defer to picking the best players um for for the group and uh enrolling from there um i think because of the connections we have in the CHL, whether it's Tim Speltz and um, in his role in Spokane in the Western League, myself with the the Sioux and Jimmy Palafito with uh, with Saginaw, and then we and it's the tie-ins we have in, in the Quebec League with Real Paymont uh, and others. I think we'd be fairly confident. The teams out there, I think they realize this, and they're I think they're more than willing to to try to work with you and whatever access you can safely have health-wise to the players. They're more than willing to grant it and. Um, so I, I don't think it will be a huge deal other than the fact that, um, you know, the, the, their, the, the runway is a little bit shorter and we're going to have to hit the ground running in terms of our education and, and integrating the players into our development model. Thanks, Kyle. 
Thank you. And we'll finish up with Lance Hornby from the Toronto Sun. Go ahead, Lance. Hey, Kyle. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, I got you, Lance. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, two quick things. Uh, the comment, please, on the two new assistant coaching hirings. And please clarify, if you will, about uh, going back to Ford Center uh, and uh, uh, the use of the uh, off-season facility. We all heard something over the, uh, the summer that uh, that was going to be a little harder for you guys. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I, I guess, I think, uh, Steve, you can jump in here. I think Sh is Sheldon doing media on one of the, uh, one of the nights coming up? Yeah, uh, after round seven. Sure. So I, I, I guess I would, I would defer to, to Sheldon more to speak on the assistance, uh, Lance. Uh, but for, for my view of it, I, the, the process that Sheldon uh, really embarked on and I was a part of, uh, it was, uh, it was, he did a very, very thorough job and his background work on all the assistance that he had and really, you know, without, without knowing Manny all too well, he had kind of focused on Manny really from the beginning, once he had done his background work on all these guys, just in terms of his fit on his own experience, the job that he had heard he had been doing in Vancouver, uh, his own career as a player and the style of player he was and what he brought to teams, and then just his own intelligence uh, level and, and the way that he communicated. So that was what was appealing about Manny uh, for Sheldon. I'll let him get more into the specifics on it. Uh, but I, we just thought that, you know, with his energy level and, and his communication and his professionalism, uh, that, that he was a great fit there for sure. And then with Paul, uh, Sheldon and myself have, have had a, a great relationship with Paul going back to, we had AJ, uh, Paul's son, uh, we, we came into the Sioux and uh, at the end of the 2012-13 season. And uh, I think the thing is that, that Paul brings to the staff is that he's got a ton of experience. Uh, he's seen everything in hockey. He's been in a ton of different playoffs and had uh, he's won a Stanley cup. He's won a Jack Adams trophy. He's had great seasons. He's had disappointing seasons. And I just don't think that anything phases him. And um, I think that level of calm experience is something that will add a lot, not only to our, our players and our staff, but to the whole organization, just having uh, that to, to lean on at all times and just a certain amount of uh, calm uh, uh, when things maybe don't go as well as, as we want. Um, so th that's that. And then I'll let Sheldon delve more into it in, in his thought process on both on, on Wednesday. Uh, with regards to Ford Performance Center, we're, we just really are following the guidelines, Lance, of, of the NHL first, but then also uh, the City of Toronto Public Health, uh, the Government of Ontario, and then our own MLSC guidelines. So uh, the facility has been open for, uh, for off-ice voluntary workouts and uh, the protocols are very, very strict in terms of the number of people that can be there, the number of player access people that could be there, but um, it's really back into the protocols of uh, phase two. So before the training camp portion of it and um, having the guys in there. So there's, there've been a number of, uh, of players in there already, including a lot of our, our more veteran uh, top players on our team, which has been great to see. Uh, uh, and they're work and they're working hard. So it's uh, so far so good. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kyle. I uh, hope everyone uh, continues to be well. We will catch up again tomorrow night after round one. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.